I'm really glad that all of you came today. Uh, this has been such a fun journey. Uh, Alan and I started it off and uh, we've been friends for years on, on the internet. Now we're seeing each other for the first time on Zoom. And today uh, we're gonna meet Judy Chittister. Am I pronouncing it right? Yes. And uh, Judy and I have known each other for like 20 years. Uh, she helped me with my book that some of you uh, may know about. It's called uh, The Guidebook to Rwanda's Volcanoes National Park. And uh, Dr. Goodall also uh, helped me uh, with the book by providing some pictures and wrote me a really nice review. And so I decided uh, several months ago that I wanted to uh, pursue not only updating my book, but also uh, I want to pursue actually making a mountain gorilla conservation center here in El Paso. And the vision I have right now is to see if I could get Amazon to sponsor it and actually build like an Amazon rainforest like they have in Seattle in El Paso. And then right in the middle of it would be a replica of the camp at Karasoki. So it would, it would serve two purposes. It would help to promote conservation and encourage people to, to explore conservation opportunities in their life and around the world. And of course, it'd be a wonderful spot to be cool and, and, and to explore plants. Because right now, El Paso doesn't really have anything like that. So I said to myself, well, I just need to talk to more people and get to know more people and just keep this on my focus. So that's one of the motivations I have for wanting to organize this presentation is just to reconnect with Judy and other people around the world who are interested in gorillas. We start by you uh, telling the story of how you ended up meeting Diane Fossey. Oh, yes. Well, Diane needed to come into the capital city of Kigali, and there was only one student left up there. She was coming in to meet more students. And she wanted a friend of mine of ours with the Red Cross to go up and stay with a little orphaned gorilla. But Liza couldn't get the time free. Her name was Liza Escher. So my, admin, my boss said, well, I know someone that would love to come up. So I went up and I spent five or six days, which included my birthday that year, taking care of the little gorilla that was then known as Charlie, who they found out was actually a female. And um, you can hold it up so you can actually yeah. fill the whole screen just okay. like that. There you go. Yes. Uh, Charlie had a little box to sleep in in the room. And every day I made him go out and walk, or her, <laughs> and would walk with Diane's dog. And of course, those little gorilla would get too far behind and sort of pound his chest because he wanted me to come back and pick him up. And when I came back down the mountain, somebody who had worked with the gorillas said, did he always want you to carry him? And I said, yes. And he said, well, face it, you're the closest thing he's seen to his mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then we would take our long walk and I would sit down in Diane's recliner and to climb on my lap and go to sleep. I had to cover myself, of course, with a poncho because it wasn't house trained, <laughs> but just would curl up there. But she loved to push that aside where she could touch me, touch my body. <laughs> and uh, this is a close up picture of the little gorilla asleep on me, which I think. For all the people who think of gorillas as ferocious animals, there's no possible way <laughs> that you can feel that way about these animals. They are so wonderful to be around. And the little gorilla was willing to do most anything. Celery was their favorite food to eat, the wild celery. And Diane had a young man who would, a young African fellow who would go every day and collect things for her to eat and she would just sit there but I had to give her medication a couple of times a day because she had been in captivity for a while but uh, she didn't mind that because she got some berries afterwards 
but she was uh, quite a handful. She was, um, they think two or three years old and she was sort of like a two or three year old child, maybe weighed a little more than a two or three year old child. But I thought it was good for her to get out and get the exercise of walking around there, around the place. And always had this mischievous look as though she was looking for the next thing to get into. <laughs> she, she never had her mind stop working. She was not a dumb animal by any manner of means. <laughs> That's right. Constantly watching just to see what was around and what could happen. But she was very accepting of most people who came around there because most people were there for her own good. And <clears throat> before I went up there, our ambassador went up and got to meet the baby gorilla. And this is in a picture of <clears throat> Ambassador Robert Malone and Diane and the baby, who was then called Charlie, later called Bonane. Now this story about uh, the baby gorilla is mentioned in the, in the book, Gorillas in the Mist, but your story is not really told in that book. No, and I don't know, that, I, she saved quite a few gorillas right. from poachers, but I know that but was this in is the it. only one that's been, that was introduced in the wild I while you were so. there. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of you that have not seen my book, uh, Judy's story is included in my book. And tell us about how the story got originally published. Oh, yes. Oh, you mean originally? Yeah, the story. That, uh, yeah. Originally, I wrote a, after experiencing this, I wrote an article for our State Department newsletter. And they published it with some pictures. Um, I called it Getting to Know a Gorilla. But um, it was really, I, I made a lot of friends in the Foreign Service who contacted me after seeing the article in the state magazine. Then when I came here, Rick came to speak about the mountain gorillas. And I told a friend of mine that I was going and he said, well, take your pictures. And I said, oh, this man doesn't want to see my picture. But when I got there, Rick was quite happy <laughs> to meet me and hear my story. And he has made me feel even more lucky than I felt before of the experience of having it. And then after I'd gone through the time with the mountain gorilla up there, I went up one time with the students and got to go out and see group five. And the, one of the small gorillas climbed up on my legs and then sort of walked away. But then the big silverback started toward me and the little one ran back and got on my legs again, sort of like, now dad, this is my friend. And they got a picture of that, which is one of my very favorite pictures of me with the gorillas. The hardest thing was not to touch that silverback. That is the most beautiful thick fur you could ever hope to see. But it was a, a real experience to be up there with all the students too. There were about five students there at that time. Now, when you were there, did, did were you actually with Diane Fossey at the cabin or was she gone? Where did she go? At that time when I went up? Yeah. Uh, Diane was away at that time with the students. And then how long were you at the cabin? When I went with the gorilla to yeah, take care of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, uh, About six or seven days. Six or seven. And Diane came, she was there when I got there and returned before I left. Oh, okay, so you with, saw her at the cabin. With all the new students. Yeah. And when she was in Kigali, she stayed in my house. <laughs> oh, okay. So that was sitting there empty and then my dog had company. <laughs> so can you describe what it's like, what, what it was like to live there at the cabin? You know, like what it was like in the morning, you know, during well, the day and at night. Well, it was just wonderful because, first of all, it got so cold on the mountain. I had never believed that I would go to bed with two hot water bottles, three blankets, a folded up sleeping bag, and an open sleeping bag over me. 
And I get, when I finally got up in the morning, the little gorilla was quite good about not demanding a lot of attention early. I would sort of speak to it. They had their own way of communicating and it would start sort of, I'd do the same thing back and uh, it would just settle back down again until I got up. And then when it came down from the, from the little box where it slept, immediately wanted to be cuddled. So I would put the poncho around me so that she was covered with urine and stuff at that point. But she just wanted to crawl all over me and hug me and be hugged. And, and then the young African fellow would take her out to give her her breakfast. And Diane had a houseboy that had worked with her forever. And he would come in and say, all right, your breakfast is ready. I had taken up eggs and bacon and things. And he would have this wonderful breakfast prepared for me. And I would sit down and eat it. And then I could spend the rest of the day walking around with the gorilla. And he'd tell me when it was time for lunch. And then dinner time, usually I would make dinner for me. And I don't remember if it was John Fowler or Peter Veet that was left up there with me, but it was one of those two. And I would cook dinner at Diane's cabin and we would have dinner together. Did you actually stay in Diane's cab with yes. the gorilla? Mm -hmm. So can you describe what it was like inside the cabin? Uh, well, the cabin was of course corrugated metal, but she had put sort of rattan, uh, rattan hangings down on the walls inside, but there was no insulation. And the, I think, believe that through the years when the embassy had furniture to get rid of, they had taken it up there because it was very American style furniture uh, that was in the house. And she had added on to the back of it too. So there was another bedroom back there. And I believe that the second time I was up there, even though she wasn't there, I think I slept in the guest room. But um, she, she was very, very nice to me and explained to me just what to do for the gorilla so that he would be completely happy. And of course, I then was, I was in my 40s then, but I still had a lot of energy. So I would go out every day for at least two or three hours and have the little gorilla walk and build up its strength because I felt that just sitting around the cabin wasn't that good for it. So did you actually like when you took the gorillas, the baby gorilla for a walk, did you hold it by its hand or did you carry it? No, I usually just walked. And that's when it would get upset if I got too far in front of it. Oh, he would stop he, and beat his chest. Oh, for me he to would come. follow you? Or oh, yeah. He would just follow you? And again. Diane's dog would go with us. They all, you, you would just, and you didn't have to worry about the gorilla running away. He would mm. stay close to you. Mm. He wow. knew what where his bird was buttered. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I can't even, I, I don't remember all these points in our first meeting. So I'm really excited to ask you all these extra questions here, but uh, what would be the most memorable moment you had during the, that week long stay? Oh my, I think it was just one week long moment. <laughs> <laughs> the experience of, first of all, meeting Diane because I wanted to, I had been there in Rwanda then a couple of years and had never had an opportunity to meet her. And um, so to get to meet her and talk to her, we sat up very late the night before she left and she talked a lot about her life and what she'd done with it and so on. And then just to, spend, to be there, first of all, away from work because I worked very hard and I had nothing to think about but the little gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> Even I didn't have to worry about feeding myself because the meals were prepared. So it was a true vacation yeah. in, in addition to taking care of little gorilla. And uh, I had to gather its feces and weigh them and do things like that. But it was all part of well, the You thing. were the only babysitter. In other yes. Words, well, I understand. Except for a young and, African. Fellow. But when she, you, she came back mm -hmm. while you were still there. So she was yes. only gone like a week. Oh, I don't think it was quite a week. Oh, okay. And then it was a couple of months before it was released. 
And when they released the gorilla, you know, they started to release it to one group and there, it looked like it was gonna be a bad experience. And Diane broke her own rules and jumped back down out of the tree and grabbed the gorilla and climbed back up. So were you there? Did you actually see No, that? I just heard, heard about the story. it. Yeah. And then they took it to the group that it eventually ended up with. So after you finished this wonderful uh, experience in your life, did you see Diane Fossey again? I may have seen her once more, uh -huh. but when she came to town, she would usually be at the ambassador's residence or something like that. Um, but it was, it was a real experience to have met her. And I know that my friend Anne Yancey, now Syrett, who was stationed at the embassy and went up to see the gorillas, and I were in Washington when the movie came out, Gorillas in the Mist. And she and her husband and I went, and we must have stood in line three quarters of an hour to get in and see it. Wow. And the part of the film that was about Rosamond Carr was actually filmed at Roz's house. Uh -huh. We both almost broke down into tears when we saw that. Rwanda was a magic time of those of us in the embassy. It was still sort of, quote, old foreign service where everybody took care of everybody else. And we had wonderful friendships. And I probably have more longtime friendships with people that I knew in Rwanda than any other post where I served. How long were you in Rwanda? Four years. So this that must was, have been the highlight. Yes. And it was the first time in my foreign service career that I took four years. Normally, we just served two years. But I had a lovely home there and wonderful friends throughout the international community. And everybody had their interests seem to be similar. Well, when you were at the research station, your meals were cooked, your meals were cooked, for, your meals were cooked for you. Uh, breakfast and lunch. Breakfast and lunch. Uh, but then um, what about like, were there many other people there? There was only you? one student there. One student and, and many there, workers. There may have been, but they never came around the cabin. Okay. The only one that came around the cabin was the young African fellow that was hired to get food for the gorilla. Mm -hmm. And he would also gather uh, branches so that they could put, um, make a nest in that box. Right. Because the gorillas do that at night when they're going to sleep. They make themselves a nest to sleep in. And he would prepare that. So she was always comfortable and slept the way a gorilla would sleep. Did you hear any elephants at night? No. Or nothing like that? I never saw any other wild animals. Mm -hmm. When I climbed up from where we parked the cars to go up to the camp, which was from 8,000 to 10,000 feet, the guys that were going up carrying my stuff, and I had a cooler full of food and things like that, and... I said, just go ahead uh, because there was a path. I didn't need to have them. But my major worry were the buffalo up there. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any elephants up there. I never even saw a buffalo. I never saw any other animals except some birds. And um, that was it. It was a pretty steep hike up there, right? Yes, it took me. Um, it took me a little over two hours. Yeah. Then I certainly couldn't do that now. <laughs> and were there a lot of buildings at that time? There was like the building for the research. I think there were uh, three or four cabins. That's mm -hmm. all there were. Right. I can't imagine, you know, as you look back and just talking about it, uh, what kind of emotions you have about this experience. And I know you're really glad that we could bring this to this forum and, and, and we're gonna share this with even more people that are here today. If you were to say anything about Rwanda and the gorillas that you want people to know, uh, what would you say to people about the country and about the gorillas? What would you want people to know the most important thing besides this story? Well, when I was there, it was a very peaceful time, but it's so beautiful and the people for the most part, were very kind, but 
is like anyone else. Their culture is so much different than ours. And I think that's some of the hardest things that certainly Americans have in traveling to places like that is learning to live with and around the different culture. But I think it's so wonderful since the, the uh, massacres that they have done so much for the gorillas. It's become extremely expensive to go up and see the gorillas. But I think it's wonderful that there are people there who really care. I remember in the last few years, there was a gorilla killed. And some of the guys who worked up there talking about it and one of them cried. And I thought that is such a wonderful thing to make those people who have so little appreciate these animals and their lives.